We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and um, and I just, one of my favorite parts, responsibilities of this job is on most Sundays, I get the opportunity to open God's Word. Uh, Everything that we do at this church is built around uh, really how God's designed the church and what we're supposed to be talking about is all found in this book. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I want to encourage you to grab it and open it up. If you don't have one, uh, we got you, all right? Just take that Bible from in front of you, write your name in it, and keep it. We want you to have a copy of God's Word, all right? So today we're wrapping up a series that we've been going through called Stay. This is the last week of our Stay series. We're talking about mental health and understanding what does the Bible say when it comes to uh, having mental health. How can we all be in this room, those of us who are, who are followers of Christ, or maybe you're exploring the concept of being a follower of Christ, how can we have minds that are operating at the peak of health? And what does God's word say about that? On week one, Pastor Mac kind of introduced the concept of, of staying and, and tomorrow needing you and then the whole... What does the Bible say about mental health? And last week, Pastor Mike uh, got into the weeds a little bit, some practical advice that if you want to stay mentally healthy, you need to stay connected to God and you need to stay connected to his truth and his church. So we want to stay connected to this book. We want to stay connected to the church. We want to stay connected to God. All that is really good advice if you're striving for mental health. If you want to have mental health, you got to do those things. But today, we're going to look at another practical side. If you want to be mentally healthy, you also have to stay sober-minded. You have to stay clear-headed. In other words, you need to get rid of the things that are in your mind right now that aren't supposed to be there. Right, So there's, there's something about putting good things into your mind, but the other side of the equation is removing from your mind the things that are in there that don't belong. And the Bible would call that being clear-headed or sober-minded or alert. So we're going to look at Scripture. What does Scripture say to us about being alert and clear-headed and sober-minded? One main verse we're going to kind of start with today is in First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And here's what it says. It says, stay alert. Can you say that with me? Stay alert. It's very clear. All right, this is a command from Scripture for every one of us in this room. We need to stay alert. And here's why. It says, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Essentially, the reason we need to stay alert, we, the reason we need to, to clear our minds of the things that aren't supposed to be there, all those distractions, is that there's, a, there's an enemy, the devil, who is seeking to devour you. We have to understand the truth of that. Uh, one of the days we were in India, we had kind of a touristy day, and we went on this safari in northern India. 
And we were in this Jeep, and we were driving around and seeing wild animals, you know, monkeys and elephants and all sorts of things. And we were hoping to see a tiger. We were told there were a lot of tigers in this, uh, this place, and we didn't see any. That would have been really cool. But when we were all done, the whole safari was over. We're back where it's kind of safe is when they choose to tell us that this is the same place. I don't know if you remember 10 years ago, there was a viral video of a tiger leaping out of tiger grass. It's where they hide and pulling someone off of an elephant. And that's, that's exactly where this, this went down. And I'm thinking, I'm thankful you're telling us now because I don't think I would have gone, right? This open Jeep. I mean, but ultimately, if you think about it, Scripture says that Satan is like a, a, a roaming lion, that he's looking around for someone who's not paying attention, someone who's tired, someone who's, who's distracted, and that's who he's going to grab and, and pull and devour. Amen. You have to understand, right, that Satan hates everything that God loves, and God loves you. Satan wants to destroy you. That's part of his MO, is to destroy us. So when Scripture says, stay alert, Another way of looking at that is stay clear-headed and sober-minded. we got to get rid of things that are in our head that are keeping us from understanding the purpose and good plan that God has for us. So, the way I've organized our message today is is four things I want to share with you. And if you have our note sheet with us, uh, with you, you're going to notice there's four fill-in-the-blanks. These are four ways that I want to encourage you to be alert. 1 Peter 5.8, right, says stay alert. So how do we do that? The first thing you need to do to stay alert is you need to be free from distraction. You need to be free from the things that distract you from your purpose. All right, so I'm going to have this ongoing illustration this morning. Uh, If you've ever noticed that in um, in an action movie, or an action TV show, there's always, seriously, you're going to notice this now in every show you watch, there's going to be a scene where somebody, whether he's the good guy or the bad guy, I can't, I don't know, they're trying to gain access to a facility that they're not supposed to be in, right? They're, they're trying to find a way past security to get into the warehouse, to get into the police station, to get into the prison, to get into whatever it is. They're trying to get somewhere they're not supposed to be. And the thing that's keeping them from getting in there is always some sort of security system, right? So security guard. So let's give this security guard a name, okay? Because we're going to talk about him or her a lot today. So somebody give this security guard a name. Hank. Hank. Tom? I heard, I heard Hank first, all right? So is there any Hanks in this room? So so I'm not picking on anybody. All right. There's no Hanks in the room. So we have a security guard named Hank. And if you're trying to get past Hank, there's certain strategies you might use. There's certain strategies the evil one is going to use to try to sneak past the security and get into your mind. All right? And if we can see how the, the, the system works, we can be alert and keep it from happening. So don't forget Hank, all right? Let me read a passage of scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says this, Therefore, with minds that are fully alert and fully sober, set your heart on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. What this passage of scripture says is that our minds are supposed to be focused on something good, right? Our, our minds are supposed to be focused on the grace and the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. That's where we're supposed to be focused. But Satan wants to find you when you're not thinking about the goodness of God, when you're distracted by other things. And so the first thing that we're talking about is you need to be free from distraction. So let's, let's look at this. For, for, um, this, this verse gives us a couple of, of words. It says first to be alert, and it also uses this phrase fully sober. And so you're going to see that in the New Testament, anytime we have these words alert, sober-minded, clear-headed, it's pretty much two different Greek words or phrases that are used. Uh, one of them you see right here in this word fully sober. Fully sober comes from this Greek word, uh, nepho, 
And it simply means to be sober, to have a clear head that's not diluted by, by strong substance so that your mind can think clearly. So that's a literal, we just need to be sober-minded. But then there's another Greek word that's used when it says that you are alert. And that word, what it means when you look at it, a good translation in English, it, it actually means literally, you go back and look at the Greek, it says to gird up the loins of your mind. That's kind of a weird phrase, right? When was the last time you heard someone to say, to gird up the loins of your mind? I was like, what does that mean? So to understand what girding up the loins of your mind means will help you understand the importance of being free from distraction. So back in the day, right, people would have worn a big robe uh, or like uh, the, the outfits that people were wearing back in, in the early church days, right? A lot of cloth that kind of hanging down to the ground. So imagine if you were gonna run a foot race, you probably wouldn't want to run a foot race with cloth hanging down around your knees and your ankles because you're going to get tripped up in it. It's going to get wrapped up in your legs. You're going to step on it. You're going to fall. You're going to tumble. So what you would do is you would gird up your loins, right? You would pull up these, the, the, the cloth. You would grab it at least above your knees. You'd probably hold it right around here so that you could run without anything catching you up, without anything tripping you up. So when the Bible says that we need to gird up the loins of our mind, it's literally saying, get rid of all the things that are going to trip up the way you think. Get rid of all the distractions, all the things that you're not supposed to be thinking about because your focus is supposed to be on running this race. What's keeping you from doing that? You need to gird it up. You need to get it out of the way. You need to be free from distraction. So think about Hank, the security guard, for a moment. You'll notice that if you want to distract Hank in a movie, there's going to be three ways that you distract Hank. The first way that you're going to find people distracting Hank is by causing a problem somewhere else. If you want Frank to stop paying attention to his booth and, and the, the entrance, right, what you do is you just blow up a building on the other side of the, the compound, Right? If you cause a fire somewhere, you, you cause a noise, you throw a rock somewhere, you, you cause a problem somewhere, and then what is Hank going to do? He's going to get up, he's going to be distracted now by a problem somewhere else, and you get to skirt right in. And what Satan wants to do is he wants to sneak into your mind. He wants to find you distracted, and one of the ways he does it is by causing problems in your life, by distracting you with issues and troubles so that all of your mind goes and focuses on those things, and you're not focused on the promises and the goodness of God. And so let me show you how, how that works. In, in John uh, chapter 16, verse 33, it says this, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. And then he says this, one of the crummiest promises in all of Scripture. You might be like, did the pastor just say there's a crummy promise in Scripture? Hey, listen, this book is full of promises, and the next promise you're going to hear is one that you're not going to read in one of those little daily affirmation calendars. And it's this, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. That's a promise. I'm sorry. You might not like it. That's not one of the promises you, hey, I'm going to call up my buddy and just encourage him. Hey, I just want you to know, man, I was reading scripture today. I just want to encourage you. Today, you're going to have many trials. Be blessed. All right? No, no, we don't do that. Right? But it's a promise from scripture. We know that in this life, we are going to experience troubles. We're going to have bad days. Things are going to go wrong. I don't, I'm preaching to the choir here. We all know that, right? And what Satan wants to do is he wants to take those troubles and those trials and get you so distracted and focused on those bad things that are going on in your life to cause you to not be mentally healthy. It's going to cause all sorts of problems in your life so that you dis are distracted and not paying attention from the, what you're supposed to be focused on, which is the goodness of God and the purpose that he has for your life. And so, again, you want to distract Hank, you just make a noise somewhere else, you, you cause a problem, you have a camera go wrong, you have a, a bomb go off somewhere, and Frank starts focusing on the problem. And what Satan does is he sneaks right past. Here's another thing that you would use to distract Hank. Uh, believe it or not, if you watch these movies enough, you'll see another common distraction for Hank. It's to distract Hank with a good thing. 
Hank's probably a really great guy. Hank is excited about his job. He's a good person with a good heart. So one of the things you can do to distract Hank is you just bring maybe a damsel in distress right in front of Hank's, uh, where he's supposed to be focused over here. You bring a damsel in distress over here. Maybe she's got a flat tire. And Hank's a good guy. Hank wants to help. So Hank decides he's going to do something good. And Hank loses his attention from what he's supposed to be focused on to do something good. And, and that's the tricky thing because there's nothing wrong with helping someone. In fact, there's a lot of good things in this life that I'm not going to open up scripture. And it's not going to say, like, don't help someone change a tire. It's going to say, help someone change a tire. So wh- what do we have to do with this information? Like, what, what do we do with this knowing that we can be distracted with good things? If you think about, uh, there's a quote from Jim Collins. He wrote, Good to Great. And one of his, his most famous quotes is, Good is the enemy of great. If you think about what that means, is that there is something that God has uniquely designed you to focus on. That thing is great. That's where your energy is supposed to be poured out. That's the great plan that God has for your life. And many of us get distracted from that great plan that God has for our lives by doing other good things that God is like, that's good. Like, that's a good thing. And I'm not saying to don't do, stop doing good things, all right? That's not what I'm saying. But some of you, you can look at your life and the patterns of your life, and you got so many good things going on in your life that you're not focused on the purpose and plan that God has for your life. You're always just doing good things for everybody else and all the, the plans and the people and the, the places that God has ordained for you to be doing great things are being neglected. And so we can distract Hank by doing, giving him something good to do so that he's not focused on the purpose that God has for his life. I'll give you a great example of this in scripture. Remember Mary and Martha? Mary and Martha, uh, Mary and Martha show us this difference between good and great. Jesus is in their home, and Mary and Martha are both showing hospitality to Jesus in different ways. So Martha, she's cleaning the house. She's making sure the meal is prepared. She wants to make sure that everything is really great for Jesus because she loves Jesus. She's doing a really good thing. And Mary, on the other hand, is just sitting at Jesus' feet, spending time with Jesus. And Martha's getting frustrated, right? She's saying, Jesus, would you please tell Mary, uh, like, uh, to come help me. I'm trying to do something good for you, and she's over here not helping at all. And Jesus says, Martha, listen, you've decided to do something good, but Mary's doing something great. She's focused on the purpose of this meeting right now. It's to spend time with Jesus. And so we have this concept of of good and great, and sometimes the easiest way for Satan to distract us from the purpose he has for our lives is to give us a whole bunch of good stuff to do. Here's another way that we can distract Hank, is with meaningless things. Another way to put this, if we just give Hank a really big book of crossword puzzles, we might be able to slip past him. Give Hank something that doesn't really mean anything. It's not really going to help anybody, but it's just going to distract his mind enough that we can sneak past the gate. We can get past the camera. We just got to get his mind off the screen for a little bit. And we find Satan using that same tactic, giving us enough meaningless things that we fill our lives with that our minds end up unhealthy because they're not focused on the goodness and the good plan that God has for us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this, Soldiers, don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. What it's saying is that if you're a good soldier, you understand that you've been given a very clear and specific mission, and that if you get tied up in these meaningless distractions of the world around you, you're going to miss out on uh, basically accomplishing the purpose of, of your life. On my, my trips, my, my trip to India, um, it was basically 24 hours of flying on the front end and on the back end. It was a nine-hour flight. To get there, I had to 
a, a three-hour flight basically to, to New York with some layover, and then a, a nine-hour flight to Paris, and then a nine-hour flight from Paris to Delhi. And I'll tell you what, one of the things you learn on a flight like that is that it, uh, how many of you can sleep on a plane? How many of you are good at that? How many of you are like me? And that's just like usually not an option. You can't fall asleep on the thing. All right, so uh, I, I have a really hard time falling asleep on the plane. So I'm sitting there with really nothing to do. And one of the things you'll learn is when that you're bored and when there's not a lot of things on your plate, when you don't really have any sort of purpose to fulfill, we fill it with really meaningless things to just pass the time, don't we? I became very thankful for that little screen in front of me where you could watch as many movies and television shows. You could play solitaire. I was playing Texas Hold'em with other people on the plane, I guess. Uh, I, I was keeping myself busy. And what happens when we're bored and we don't understand the purpose and the plan and our reason for being alive, we're going to fill it with all sorts of meaningless things. It's just the way it works. We're going to fill it with TV and hobbies and golf and sports and all. I mean, none of those things are bad. I'm not saying stop watching TV, don't ever play golf. I'm not saying any of that. Here, here's what I'm saying. There's a lot of these, these things, you can look at them and say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm watching way too much television. I'm, watch, I'm doing so many meaningless things in my life that I'm just so bored not understanding and fulfilling the purpose that God has for me that I'm just filling my time with things that don't really mean anything. And so Satan wants to distract you with problems. He wants to distract you with good things. He wants to distract you with meaningless things. Those are all types of distractions. Here's the second thing, right? If you want to be alert, not only do you need to be free from distraction, you also need to be free from numbing. You need to be free from numbing and when you hear the word to be sober-minded, I would think the first thing that should come to your mind, right, is to be free from allowing your body to be uh, drunk, right? If you're going to be sober-minded and clear-headed, you need to make sure you stop numbing your mind with all sorts of things that keep you from being able to think clearly. That would be free from numbing. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, well, sober-minded, I think Matt's just focused on, we need to be free from consuming too much alcohol. That is certainly one of the things I'm talking about. We have learned in this world how to numb the, the things that, when you are struggling with mental health, when your mind is not thinking clearly, when you're struggling with anxiety or pain or struggles or whatever it is, depression, what we like to do is numb that stuff. We like to make it just go away. And one of the primary ways in our culture that we do that, it happens to be through alcohol. A lot of people just like to just drink until your problem seems to go away. Maybe it's drugs and you are not thinking clearly, you're not having a clear head because you're numbed all those things through the consumption of drugs. But I'm not just talking about alcohol and drugs. There's all sorts of things. Every one of us in this room, you know what your vice is. You know what the thing is that you turn to when you have a really bad day. I know what mine is. Like mine's sugar. Anybody with me? I'll eat myself happy. Like I'll, I just... We all have these things that we do that we numb the pain that we're experiencing. We numb the problem we're experiencing. I, I wrote a list. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but I'm gonna, by the time I'm done with this list, every one of you is gonna feel like your toes are stepped on a little bit, all right? Maybe it's drinking alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. Uh, maybe it's porn. Maybe it's sugar, like, like me. Maybe it's social media. You're just addicted to having a device in your hand and you just sit there mindlessly wasting all your time with this addiction of, of, of the screen time. Maybe it's shopping. Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's busyness. You are just so addicted to success and power that you just keep going and going. You're just addicted to work. Maybe you're addicted to comfort. You're so unwilling to get uncomfortable, you will do anything to be comfortable. I, listen, I don't know what it is, but every one of us in this room, we turn to things to numb what's going on in our mind, when the truth is, if we want to stay alert, we have to stay sober-minded. 
We have to get out of our mind the things that are numbing us from being able to experience and run into the purpose that God has for our lives. So if you think about this uh, the, uh, from the security guard perspective again, right? Hank, he's sitting in his booth. We're trying to get past. Well, well one of the things you might see in that action movie is maybe they, they figure out where Hank's going to be right before work and they just drop something in his drink. And they just know we can, we can get Hank a little loopy and we can do whatever we want when Hank's on the job. Maybe they'll put a little pipe under the door and put some sleeping gas into Hank's little booth and then Hank will fall asleep and we can go in and we can have a heyday, right? See, Satan wants to numb your mind. He wants to teach you and train you to numb yourself so that he can go in and have a field day with your thoughts. He can destroy you like a lion Luke 21, 34 says this, watch out, don't let your hearts be dull by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware. See, what I've learned is that mental health struggles often cause us to disconnect from reality and to really just hide Pretend that the world around us is different by just simply numbing ourselves and numbing the pain through all sorts of things. And, and you know, the sad thing is, is that the world, the world actually teaches you that that's what you're supposed to do. Hey, if you're not happy enough, just have another drink. If you're not feeling good enough, pop another pill, right? If you're not feeling uh, uh, lovely enough, just, you know, watch another thing on the internet you're not supposed to be watching. Just you consume, consume, consume. If you're not feeling that great about it, just sleep with someone else. Consume that. Go. And the world teaches you and trains you to go after all these things in the world to numb the truth, to, to essentially trick your mind. But Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Let me read that again. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Not dumbing down the way you think, not numbing the way you think, but changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here's a third thing. If you want to be alert, all right, you need to be free from fatigue. And this isn't like a symbolic word. I'm not trying to like give you one word and I mean something else. I literally mean if you're struggling with your mental health right now, I'll bet one of the things that you really need to probably look into is whether or not you're getting enough sleep. I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, like it, you get the worst version of me. I'm not a great person to talk to. I'm not a great person to debate with. I say things I regret. When we're tired, we don't operate well. It's just the truth. It's just the way our bodies work. On my last leg, we were flying back from London uh, to Atlanta. And I was so tired after 10 days in India. I was just exhausted. I, I was like, I can't sleep on a plane, but I'm going to fall asleep on this plane. I'm that tired. So I'm sitting there. I'm trying to fall asleep. I got my neck pillow on. I'm on the aisle seat, right? And I'm kind of a big guy. I'm sitting in coach, which was a terrible idea. But uh, I'm sitting in coach. And, and when I fall asleep, I just kind of like my leg just kind of falls, flops out into the aisle. Right? I'm trying to keep it in because I know I'm going to be, I don't want my leg in the aisle, but I'm just falling asleep. And there was like three times on that leg that I was abruptly awoken by the beverage cart. You know, I'm just sitting there and I'm sleeping and all of a sudden, bam, woo, woo. And the, the you know, flight attendants are thinking, I'm so sorry, sir. I'm like, oh, it's my fault. My knee's sitting there, right? But at the end of the day, like when we're tired, we lose control. Like we, we don't, our our bodies flop and whatever, and we're like acting all weird, snoring, whatever. We don't even know what we're doing because we're just exhausted. And the truth is that if you're struggling with your mental health, there's probably an element of it that you just need to maybe check if you're getting enough rest. Because you're not going to be alert 
if you're not getting enough rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, through verse 30 says, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and, I will, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. This word yoke that you see on, it says, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. He's not talking about like the, the yellow orange part of an egg, right? He's talking about something else. A yoke is that piece of wood that you would put two oxen, right? You would have one oxen, uh, one ox on one side, another ox on the other, and you, you yoke them together with this piece of wood around their neck so that when they're pulling or plowing or whatever it is they're doing, they're working together. Well, Jesus actually says, listen, how, how cool is it that I want to invite you to be yoked together with me? Do you know who's going to do all the pulling when you're yoked together with Jesus? Who's going to do the heavy lifting? Who's going to carry that burden? Have you ever been in a situation where you're helping someone move and you got someone on the other side of a piece of furniture and you realize at some point, I'm actually the one doing all the lifting here? Well, that's how it is. Jesus says, listen, listen, you can pretend. Get on the other side of the table. Let's carry this thing in. But at the end of the day, I'm going to carry the burden. I got to take care of it for you. And he says that when you yoke yourself together with Christ, you're going to find rest for your soul. I mean, one of the best ways to slip past Hank, probably 30% of the movies, how do they get past Hank? He's asleep. They didn't have to do anything. They just wait till three in the morning. Hank's tired. He's exhausted. He's a good guy, but he's a tired guy, and he falls asleep on the job, and you just walk right past him. See, the truth is Satan can slip all sorts of things past, past you. All sorts of things slip into your mind when you're tired and you're not getting enough rest. If you want to be mentally healthy and you want to be alert, you got to be free from fatigue. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says this, so be on your guard. Not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. I mean, could it be any clearer? If you want to be alert and clear-headed, you can't be asleep. You got to have some rest. Now, here's the fourth thing. If you want to be alert, this one kind of is an obvious one, but you need to be focused on your purpose. You need to be focused on your purpose. You know, Pastor Mac got up on this stage two weeks ago, and he said this. He said, stay. Tomorrow needs you. And I don't know about you, but there's probably some of you in this room, you're thinking, well, sure, you can say that tomorrow needs me, but I don't understand why. Why does tomorrow need me? Would tomorrow actually care if I wasn't here anymore? Would anybody notice if I was gone? I don't feel like I'm actually fulfilling any sort of purpose in my life. I feel like there's no real reason for me to be alive. Nobody care if I just stopped breathing. Uh, so why does tomorrow need me? And you have to understand, if you know your purpose for being alive... If you know that God has a plan for you and it's a good plan and that he's working something really incredible through you, you might not know what it is right at this moment. You might be struggling because there's all sorts of things, distractions you gotta get rid of. But just understand when you're thinking clear-headed, you're gonna see very clearly a purpose and a plan and it's a good plan. You need to focus on your purpose. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. What this reminds us of is that God has a purpose for your life. And when you live in the purpose, whatever God does around you, all the good things, the bad things, all of those things are all worked together for the good that God has planned for you. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. Man, you can just stop that verse right there. How many of you in this room right here are like, what, no one has ever told me before that I am a masterpiece. 
A masterpiece is this, right? When an artist, maybe they paint a thousand things in their lifetime. They're painting stuff every day. They're creating things. Well, they're going to have one piece, one piece that really kind of summarizes the, the wholeness of their, their talent and their, their passion and their, their heart and their mind and what they're trying to create. And they would create that one piece and that would be their, their masterpiece. That's it. All these other things have been leading up to this one moment. I'm never going to create something like this again. It's my masterpiece. And God says that each and every one of us in this room, that we are a masterpiece. That when he created you, he created you with such passion that you are created exactly, you're, you're exactly what he wanted. For we are God's masterpiece. It says he created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Get this. Maybe no one's ever told you this before. Before you were even born, God already had a very good, great plan for your life. He already had something very specific in mind that he wants you to fulfill in your lifetime for his goodness and his glory. Now, some of us, we struggle to know what it is. Like, man, the reason I, I struggle to know whether or not tomorrow needs me is I don't really know what the purpose is for my life. Why am I here? Well, I can give you like a, an overarching purpose. I can tell you the, if someone just says, hey, what is the purpose of my life? You should all be able to say at least this sentence, all right? My purpose is to know God, to love God, to enjoy God, to glorify God, and to make him known to others. Like, that's why we all exist, we exist to, to know God, to love him, to enjoy him, to glorify him, and to make him known to other people around us so they can do the same things. That's, that's why God put us on this planet. But the truth is that for each of us, he's given us different talents, different gifts, different passions. He's given each of us a different personality type. He's given us different experiences. Maybe you've experienced really good things in your life. Uh, like a, a successful business or a successful marriage. Maybe you've experienced some really hard things. Maybe you've lost someone you've loved or you've gone through addiction or you, uh, you know, you've been through a really painful divorce or whatever. Those experiences, all of those things, uh, God uses all of them together for his good. So those things that make you, unique, you uniquely you, God takes those things and he pulls them together and he has a really good and perfect plan for you to fulfill this thing in your way. Like we're all gifted differently. You know, like Leah, you were on stage this morning singing for the first time. I'm so glad that God gave you a gift that he didn't give me. And that God can take each of us and use our gifts to be able to lead other people to know God and glorify him and love him and enjoy him forever be, and, and to that we all get to do that in our own different way. But we have to know our purpose and then we have to live in it. We each have different gifts and passions, but we're all called to this thing behind me nonetheless. First Peter 5, remember we, we started with 1 Peter 5, 8. Let me show you what 1 Peter 5, 9 says. It says, stand firm against him. This is Satan. Stand firm against Satan, that lion. It says, and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. This verse is encouraging in two different ways to me. Number one, the real obvious one is it says that those thoughts you're feeling right now, those things that maybe you've experienced that cause you to have not a real strong mental health. Maybe you're struggling with anxiety or depression or worry or fear or whatever those things are that are overwhelming you right now in your spirit. I want you to know that those are not unique to you. Other people in this room are experiencing some of those same exact feelings and thoughts. But what God's word says is that in order to stand firm, in order to stay alert, Right, it says to stand firm against him, to be strong in our faith. Right, we need to stay connected to God. We need to stay connected to his word. We need to stay connected to the church. We also, though, need to stay sober-minded. We need to get rid of distractions. We need to get rid of fatigue. We need to get rid of numbing. And we need to stay focused on the purpose that God has for our life. 
So what now? What do we do with this? As we ask this question, it's a three-word prayer, and we ask God, God, what do you want me to do with this information? Listen, as we've gone through these last three weeks, an overarching truth that I know to be true when we talk about this concept of staying is that I know with all of my heart that tomorrow does need you, that God has a good and wonderful plan for your life. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to take some of the things we've been talking about over these last three weeks and figure out, God, what do you want me to do? What do I need to hang on to? What is the thing I really need to to go deeper into? What is it that I need to change in my life? And from today specifically, here's two questions I want you to ask yourself right now. I want you to pray these things and ask God for help in answering these questions. And maybe all week, continue to ask God these questions. The first one is this. What is keeping you from being clear-headed in your purpose? Is it some sort of distraction? Is it something you're using to numb your mind? Are you not getting enough sleep? What is it that's keeping you from being clear-headed in your purpose? The second question might be a better first question, which is what is your purpose? Just go to God and say, God, would you help me find some clarity in my purpose? I know you've given me gifts. I know you've made me unique. I know I've got these experiences. What do you want me to do with all this for your purposes? How do I know you and love you and enjoy you and glorify you? How do I let others know about you using the gifts and the passions and the experience and the personality you've given to me? Ask God to show that to you if you're struggling to see it. But here's what I know. You have a purpose. You just might not have clarity right now what it is. And it's because your mind is clouded with distraction. Get rid of those things. Put them out so you can see clearly the purpose that God has for your life. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that when we open it, it never returns void. That we can open up your word and see very clearly a path towards mental health. We can see that there's this powerful, powerful importance to stay connected to you, to stay connected to that vine. Father, to stay connected to your church and to your word and to stay clear, to steer clear of all these things that distract us. God, help us to be clear-minded, clear-headed and and sober-minded, Father. Help us to understand what it is that you've put us on this planet to accomplish so we can stay focused on it instead of on all these other things. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.